you doing? I mean, so much of my work is reliant on the people before me. And I think that's an important thing to bring up. Um, I'm super blessed to work with the, obviously this has been said before, so I don't, I'm not saying anything new, but like I work with the best fucking laminator in the entire world. Now there are a lot of people who are really, really good and talented, but sorry, you can't touch that guy. End of story. What's his name? Alex Villalobos, the super wolf. Puta madre. Like the guy is so good. The Super Wolf, he is back here today. If you want to know how he got that nickname, you'll have to go back in time to 2018 to listen to our episode. The first time he was on this show, um, let me check my notes real quick. It was episode number 205 of Surf Splendor. But he's back here today, thanks to the man whose voice you just heard, Surfboard Sander, Alex Banier. So, of course, after Alex said that, messages poured in asking for a Super Wolf episode. And because it's been about six years since he was on the show the first time, figured it was high time to have him back. Alex Villalobos has worked in surfboard factories throughout Southern California, worked with a who's who of illustrious board builders from Rich Pavel, Tom Eberly, Joel Tudor, right up through until right now, he's working with Ryan Birch and Derek Disney, among many others. His resin tints had become so popular, in fact, that Wavestorm knocked off his exact aesthetic and applied it to one of their most popular soft top models. It's still available on the market today. I'm sure that you've actually seen it in the water. So he's the only laminator that I know of on the planet with that very dubious distinction. He and I ran some numbers to try to determine how many surfboards he's laminated, and we came up with the rough number of 20,000 surfboards, most of which had color work, so it's a complicated process. Uh, he would never, ever accept the moniker of being best in the world at something. You'll probably hear him deflect that today, but the reality is if you talk to anybody who's met him, he is known for being kind, humble, hardworking, and incredibly talented. So anyways, this episode, today's show, all of our shows are made possible with support from Rourke.com, RealWaterSports.com, and VayerWatches.com. I'm telling you, go to Rourke.com, look up the Layover Traveler Pant. They are my everyday pant. They're incredible. They've got like a durable kind of stretch material that they're made out of. So durable enough to just dust off. If I got foam dust from going to see Super Wolf, dusts off easy, but they're super comfortable. It's a great fit. They have zip pockets so my phone doesn't slide out. Uh, RealWaterSports.com is currently doing their used gear sale. So they've got surfboards, kite gear, accessories, uh, up to 70% off, but surfboards from Pizel, Christensen, AJW, Lost, really incredible stuff. Go check them out. And then, of course, VayerWatches.com, ocean-ready, U.S.-assembled watches made from premium materials, surgical-grade steel, sapphire crystal, premium movements, but they're just available at way less than you are paying for watches from the legacy brands that you've known your whole life. And that's because they're direct to consumer. They've rethought the business model. So it's incredible quality product for an incredible price. I am proud to wear these daily, veyerwatches.com. Okay, let me check my notes, make sure I hit everything. Oh, weekend vans. Today, uh, we christen our weekend van. Weekendvans.com actually built out a podcast studio for us in a Sprinter van. So they build Sprinter vans. You can order one from them. They will outfit it for you and your family for camping. This one actually has solar power. It has a refrigerator. It has a stove. It has an outdoor shower. It sleeps five people. It's a 2024 uh, Mercedes Sprinter van. So it drives like a dream. It's incredible. And um, I'm podcasting in it. You'll hear the acoustics in it are also incredible for podcasting, incidentally. And so I'm just a huge fan. Weekendvans.com. Thank you very much. You can also find them on social media. At least give them a follow. Even if you're not in the market, give them a follow and just see what they do because it's super cool. And um, you can also rent it. This van that we have is actually available to rent. They're based in San Diego, but they'll ship you a van no matter where you are. They've shipped them everywhere. So Weekendvans.com. Thank you very much. My name is David Scales for Surf Splendor. I hope that you enjoy my conversation with Alex 
Super Wolf Via Lobos. Enjoy. Surf Splendor. Um, really, what I most want to talk to you about, I don't know how much the listeners care about it, but I want to learn about your DJ career, your DJ <laughs> life. <laughs> Are you trying to keep it a secret or no, are, no, you, no, no, okay. no. Do you yeah. publish music? Like what? No, I, um, yeah, I've never really kept it a secret. I just never really, um, combined the two worlds, you know, gotcha. they're such two foreign, you know, um, kind of almost felt fight club ish in a way, <laughs> but, um, yeah, no, there's a, uh, yeah, it's just, it's, it's bizarre, but, um, I've never, I've never kept it a secret. It's just one of those things. Like if you know, you know, yeah. you know, now I know now, you know, yeah. How, uh, how'd you get involved? How, uh, did all, I, how did it all start? I mean, I've just always been a big music fan, you know, um, whether it was like all kinds of music. I mean, my dad is a professional bass player was, well, he's playing again, actually. Um, and that was his career, oh. uh, as I was growing up, you know, and he was just, busy all the time with with his band I mean, they had a, he had a gnarly schedule back then it was it was i just found out how much he actually worked and played and i was like whoa i can't even imagine was he in a band that we would he know? was in a bit no no um you'd have to be kind of older and from south florida and the disco days okay it was like it was uh south florida's hottest disco band and it was like from the mid seventies to probably the mid eighties. So you could imagine the shenanigans they got into. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, that was when disco, that was the beginning and the end of disco. He yeah. Rode the whole wave. Of yeah. Disco. They had a pretty crazy setup though. Like, um, my uncle, which is not my blood uncle, but they were like best friends. And so, you know, and they, they were like eternal roommates and like, you know, my dad bought a house and converted the garage for, for Jay, un uncle Jay. He's the, he's the, uh, the, uh, played guitar and his dad jay's dad i think he it was new york or somewhere on the east coast and he owned a really big record distribution company so um he would send jay like all the promos and they'd have to sift through all the the records to find out which which tracks they thought would be the most popular ones coming out to get a jump out of out of all the other bands playing and then they'd cover that that song so, and then they, so they'd practice all day, find records, copy these, these tracks, play them live. They did this six nights a week. Wow. Yeah. Six nights a week. And then they'd have one day off where they'd have to practice these new songs and then had right. it start over again. Yeah. So for a while, I, I barely saw him. Like we, he'd get, sometimes he'd get like a few days off and we'd go fishing or something. My mom and him separated when, 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 when they were very young. I was young too. Gotcha. They were kids. How they, old they had me when they were, uh, my dad was, well, when, when, finally when I was born, he was 17. My mom was 16. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah. But, um, so yeah, I mean, so when I'd see him, we'd, we'd go fishing, but going back to the music, um, you know, it's something that's been around. And then my stepdad was involved in, in, uh, in music as well. And he was, but he was from the other end of the music business. He was, he was a tour promoter. Mm. Um, and he managed a few bands. Um, he was tied in with the police. He was taking them down to South America a lot. He was one of the founders of that big festival, um, uh, rock and Rio. Okay. I don't know if you ever heard that. It's no. they've had it for like years. He's not part of it and anymore. Um, but I think I think once you, I think it he's still somehow in, involved. Sure. But so what music so I, do you remember having in the house growing up? I mean, everything. You know, uh, like when I was a little kid, my favorite, my, my favorites were Jimi Hendrix and The Police and Prince. That's diverse. As, yeah. As far as I can remember, those were like the first bands. You know, I used to go see bands all the time as a little kid with my mom. Mm. Um, sometimes they'd get too rowdy and my mom would pull me. Like, I think it was 84, 85, I saw The Clash. Wow. And and my mom had to pull me. I didn't even really know the, the, the you know, how grand, how crazy that was at the time. It was just no, another band. I knew who they were at the time. But uh, I remember, like, it got pretty rowdy, and my mom was like, okay, I think I was like, I must have been six or seven or something. <laughs> <Six>. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> saw the police a bunch of time. I mean, there's so many bands that I can't even remember. I have to like, sometimes I have to ask my, my stepdad who my mom and him are not, not together anymore, but for about 12 years of my life, we, he was like my, my stepdad. So I still have a really good relationship with him. Um, but sometimes I'm like, did we go see them? He's like, yeah, but that's how young I was. Cause it, you know, it was just a part of your life. Yeah. Just attending, going to wherever they're working basically. Yeah, totally. And then, uh, you know, so it sounds like your mom was the music fan. She, she was the, she music was the fan one dating too, yeah. the dudes who are <laughs> <laughs> totally right. <laughs> she was the common denominator. <laughs> uh, yeah. um, it's interesting. I mean, so did you have any musical talent? Do you ever? No. Tried? Okay. No, did I used to try? like drum pots and pans and, and phone books and shit, you know, like I would do that, but no, I never, I never tried. Um, I kind of wanted to, but it seemed like once I started getting into surfing, everything just like yeah got focused on that i still you know i had i would make like uh you know pause record mixtapes i used to do that all the time ever since i was a little kid in fact i i found one of the earliest ones that i made and i didn't even have a um i only had like a tape player and recorder it wasn't even attached to a radio mm. so i have i mean i, I was young i was I must have been like six or seven as well and I would um, put it next to the speaker yep. <laughs> and then just pause. And then a good song, I would like go through the radio and try to find it. R radio stations in Miami were super diverse back then. Okay, They had a lot of like live DJs playing like freestyle and electro and stuff in those early days. Um, early rap, you know. Yeah. Um, and then also all like the college station, WVUM, would play some cool stuff. So it was a matter of like, I would just like, surf the dial you mm. know and then something cool would be on it didn't matter if it was halfway through i'd press record okay. so these mixes were like pretty weird you know interesting but i just found one recently I, I don't know where i placed it but i found it at my um my grandma's house i was like oh my god this is pretty funny i can't Me. believe she still has this did you listen back to it uh i haven't i don't have a tape player right <laughs> <laughs> you gotta find to somebody one. with an older car yeah and they'll totally. probably have one no, I, w I wouldn't mind buying one. Um, you got to be able to find them yeah. on Amazon or something. Yeah, they're around. You can get it. I'd be curious to hear what was on it. Um, yeah, yeah, me too. I mean, it would probably it'd, spark memories. It'd probably you know? be like some Egyptian lover, maybe some Billy Idol, like yeah. all across the board, like the stuff that was being played on the radio at the time. And Miami's a melting In my, pot. Yeah, you know, totally. So yeah. They would have everything. That sort of formed my musical, you know, um, world definitely that impact at um, that time i my parents both had a passion for music my dad is a musician actually as nice. well and yeah, he's still, yeah, yeah. he still plays in a band um i didn't inherit any of that talent for but i have a major appreciation for it sounds like similar to you right where it's like those memories from my youth are so crystal clear of Tracy Chapman right you know right, like my right, mom right. I remember that first Tracy Chapman record and my mom we lived in Long Beach and she had a record player and playing that and like it was just even as a young kid you know what good music is I think yeah, yeah. you know and that was one one that stood out for me um so you didn't have any musical talent but that ultimately translates to DJing at some point yeah so how does the DJing come about um I, you know when I was still in Florida uh, a good friend of mine, um, uh, Lance O'Brien, a.k.a. Lanzo, he was a dance hall reggae DJ, okay. and he was pretty popular around around town in that whole area. He still he still does a lot of events. Maybe you've seen his sticker, uh, Col Culture Shock. Yeah. Yeah, so that that's him. Oh, dude, the reggae guy. Now yeah. I totally know who you're talking Lance, about. Lance, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. He's one of my longtime friends. And his brother, Shay, is one of my best friends who owns... Hotel Chancletas in yeah. um, Nicaragua. I've stayed there. So those guys were a big reason why I ended up in San Diego. The, wow. Them and like a few other guys okay. that were all from the same same little speck, you know, South Beach, Miami. <laughs> um, so being around Lance and seeing his setup in his bedroom and being surrounded by records and having the accessibility to make... To me, it was like, oh, wow, you can make mixtapes on the fly with what you want. You don't have to wait on the radio or, or whatever or, or, or you know, uh, play, you know, buy, buy LPs or cassettes and then pick the songs you like. And mm -hmm. you didn't have to do that. You could just 
boom, 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 do it. Problem was, it was so expensive for oh, me okay. that I never really, I wanted to, but it was like, I'd rather buy a surfboard. I'd rather like, yeah, you know, that kind of stuff. But it wasn't until about, I'd say like 98, 99, 2000, more 2000, um, when I met my current wife at the time, she was just my, my friend, roommate. She had a pair of turntables in her house. And I was like, finally, I get to play and figure this out, you know? Um, and uh, I had already started getting into, like, more dance music stuff, like drum and bass and, like, you know, stuff like that. Um, and uh, so, and that's what, that's how I met her, just going out to parties and that whole scene started slowly getting into that which is funny but um you know if you think back at the stuff being played on the radio stations in miami a lot of it was like four four beats and break beats but with you know like the freestyle coming out in miami it was basically like electro with vocals and okay or it could be like a like a you know house music with vocals and stuff i didn't think at the time i liked dance music <laughs> but then all of a sudden you're like you know you have an experience at a club and yeah. whatever you hear it on a proper sound system and it makes sense and then all of a sudden you're like whoa i mean in that environment where it's pulsing and it's energy yeah you appreciate it yeah yeah you're driving in your car maybe not so much no not so much it sounds yeah. annoying it's right. just like boom 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 you know that's right. all you hear <laughs> so her turntable setup did it have a recording ability too so you could actually um, I don't like, know if it did. I didn't. Yeah, I think okay. it. I think it might have. Um, but you weren't like creating music and capturing not yet. It. Yeah, not yet. I just had to learn how to mix records and stuff. You know, okay. I, had, I had zero clue how to do it. Yeah, I thought you could like, you know, mix a Wu Tang Clan record into something else, and didn't even know about like BPMs and all that. And okay, how that, all that worked. So you learn it on the fly. Um, with a lot of uh, practice, I just kind of absorbed myself into it. Uh, at this point, yeah. where we're, and that was all obviously all in Florida. That was here. Oh, that was here. Yeah, that that was moving out here. Oh, okay, gotcha. Um, yeah, that that came. You know, that what that, that wasn't in Florida. In Florida, I was going out and starting to go out to clubs. That's kind of what you do in Miami. Yeah, <laughs> there's a big big club culture over there and stuff and and uh there's a lot of stuff going on um you know s sneaking in the clubs at 18 <laughs> yeah um we'll come back to the dj thing because yeah. i want to stay in florida for a minute but is that where you discovered surfing yes that's where i learned okay. to surf was in, in miami in miami yeah um the days that we see on the internet now where it's pumping obviously those are yeah. few and far between but what are the waves like normally um you know if it could it could be fun. It's it's just wind slop, you yeah. know. Yeah. Most of the time, certain times it could be good though. Okay. You know, like if you get like a good southeast wind swell, there's certain areas there. There's like a um, a jetty that gets pretty fun. There's like a little right that peels off it. Sometimes uh, South Beach gets fun, um, but the water's warm. Yeah. yeah. Um, if it's got any sort of size, it's surprisingly fun. Okay. For that for that kind of stuff, you know, it's a little different than. Um, you know, blown out stuff here. It's cold. Most of it's going to close out. Right. You know, but over there you get these little like reforms and, you know, it, it could be pretty fun. Then it turns on, you know. Right. So we had this like juxtaposition of like being surf starved, but then every few times a year, it seemed like in the 80s it would happen a lot more, but like you get these north swells that were just pumping. Um, you didn't really, didn't re realize how good it was. Until you come out here yeah. and you're like, but I thought there was going to be this everywhere. Right. <laughs> well, I'm always surprised by how good those surfers, those local surfers actually surf when the waves get good. Because yeah. I figure if you're wave starved surfing crap surf all the time, you're not going to be equipped to right. handle it when it gets good. You know, I think it's because it gets so good there. I mean, like those waves at South Beach, when it's pumping, you're either planted on the sandbar or in the tube very fast. It happens so fast. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, it happens to everybody. If you're not eating shit every other wave, you're probably not trying hard enough there. Right. <laughs> so you figure it out Because it, it jacks. It jacks hard and it pitches round and out. Like, it's got this crazy pitch right. to it that you got to really get into it. Um, and every wave's a tube. Right. You know, like, when it's doing that. 
and it's um, in shallow water too. It's breaking in shallow water. Who were you getting boards from? Um, there was a guy Joey Mulhern back then. Okay, he used to um, his label is called Backyard. Okay, unrelated to the backyard out here. Got it. Um, I think at some point he might have been getting blanks from Doug Wright, who used to do rainbow surfboards, also okay. unrelated to the rainbow surfboards out here. Okay. Uh, he was one of my favorite shapers. I, I got such good r- surfboards from him, not custom, but just off the rack or secondhand. But all my rainbows worked really good. What style of boards were you riding? Uh, your typical 80s boards. You know, I had a couple quads. Okay. Um, you know, uh, just 80 short boards, wide pointy noses. You know, I don't know what they were, maybe 13 and a half inches wide. Yeah. Little beaks. You know, flat decks, um, a lot of like single bump squash with four Mm -hmm. belly channels, you know, stuff like that. Uh, A million laminates, you know, pro light lamb, (laughs) Clark foam, whatever, you know, it's pretty funny. That is funny. Yeah. Um, Textured deck. You know, I had a couple of Ocean Avenues that had textured decks. I would always, always seem to like buy secondhand boards through the surf shop that belonged to, you know team writers or pros or whatever they always seem to because they were light yeah you know what brought you to california surfing okay yeah i mean uh at the time it just seemed like i really i really wanted to surf as much as i can and i saw it not really at the time i thought like you know if i stay in miami i'm gonna it's gonna be a lot of partying clubbing involved maybe get into some shenanigans with my friends that might land me in jail or something, you know? Cause I mean, South beach at the time was, was pretty rough, you know? Uh, so some of my friends aren't around it, you know, and others are not doing too, too well. So, some are doing really good, you know, but it's, it was pretty rough. Um, I felt at the time, like there was a window where I'm like, I just want to, go surf as much as I can. And, and that's how I, and then I had some friends like Shay was living out here. Uh, I, I had a handful of friends, George Salas. He was a photographer. I don't know if you ever heard of him. Mm-mm. Worked with Art Brewer for a long time. Okay. Yeah. He lived out here. Um, I had, a, I had a, I had a, like a crew of friends. So. Um, how old were you when you made the move? <clears throat> uh, 19. Okay. April of 92. Okay. Yeah. So I was a few months into being 19. Um, the plan was to surf, but what were you going to do for work? Well, I told my parents that I was coming out to go to school. <laughs> <laughs> so that they would write you a check? <laughs> no, a so they check? could dig and support, you know, and be like, cool. You know, they were very supportive. And, and I did enroll um, in M- Mesa College for, you know, I, I did a few semesters. But the problem is that that first couple of years, like winter would come around and I was surfing blacks a lot and it was like six foot for like, like it seemed like a month and a half. It just fired every day. It was like the best waves that I've ever seen in my life. And I ended up like just kind of dropping out or like just falling behind. Cause I'm like, Oh, like, um, yeah. So, and then I took a break, uh, and then I got a job at um, this nightclub as a bar back. I think I didn't wasn't even legal yet to work there, but I did. Um, I worked there for a bit, uh, surfed a bunch. I surfed more than working in that in that industry than I did working in the surfboard industry. <laughs> it's true. That's the best gig, the yeah. nightlife gig. Because I worked, you know, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Some, or if it wasn't that, it was. It was Friday, Saturday, Sunday, or Thursday through Saturday. And I made enough money to, yeah. like, you know, survive and save a little money, g- go on trips, um, and surf the rest of the week. Like, nothing but time to surf. Right. Um, so I did that for a while. And then uh, my friend Jimmy was working at Moonlight, and he slid me into the industry. And then after that, I never – I sh- probably should have taken – a business class or something in school, but I just went full on into the surf industry after that. Um, and just, I mean, that's what I wanted to do. Did your parents have any hopes or ambitions for what you would do in terms of professionally? 
I'm sure they wanted to me like, you know, I'm, I'm a, uh, I'm Cuban American. So every Cuban kid is expected to either be a lawyer or a doctor or, okay. you know, yeah. so who knows, you know, I mean, I'm sure it was kind of a shock when I got, went full on into surfing when I was like, you know, I already knew like at 15 years old or whatever, you know, I'd been surfing like a year, maybe two years that this is what I was going to do for the rest of my life. It's probably not what your parents want to hear. They're like, what? It's like kind of joining the Harry Krishna cult or something. Like, what do you mean you're going to just surf all day? Totally. You know, you're like, yeah, yeah. why not? <laughs> yeah. Well, um, did that job just happen out of happenstance or did you have any ambition to actually work with surfboards? Was that part of the goal? I, I mean, I, I was interested in it. But more because I just wanted to make myself surfboards and have cheaper surfboards. Yeah, yeah. I knew, like, getting into it would lead to that somehow. I didn't, like, you know, I wasn't dreaming of being a shaper or anything. I was like, what's, you know, I'm not good enough to be a pro. Yeah. <laughs> so what's the next best thing, you know? Um, I guess let's make surfboards. Did you keep your night job? Or did um, that run its course? You know, at, at the beginning, I kind of did because... Um, it was sort of touch and go at first, you know, I didn't know like if I was going to be any good. Um, I had a couple of like rough patches at first where uh, like Peter and Moonlight was like, I don't know if this guy's going to work out, you know, like I was just doing satins and um, you know, it's hard to get into it at an entry level and do the quality that expected from you at Moonlight. Totally. So it, it was hard. It was a lot of like, you know, uh, doing stuff and then Sally, Peter's wife, who was QCing, just rejecting most of what you were doing and have to fix it, you know, and then, you know, Jimmy would show me how to fix it or show me what I did wrong. And, uh, you know, and I, and I, I could tell it was like, Hey man, we need someone to, I mean, I'd be in the same situation. I'm like, get this guy out of here. Like sure. we need someone now. He needs to be somewhere else or, you know, but, um, I, I, you know, they, they kind of kept me around and, um, you know, I guess I started to improve enough to not get fired. <laughs> and to quit your quit your night job. But I quit I ended the, up quitting my night job, yeah. The night job is fantastic if you're a surfer, as we stated, but it's not long term, you know, like right. that late night thing and then you're around booze all the time yeah. and so you're imbibing and then it's for a twenty five year old. Maybe yeah. you can make it to thirty or something. But I, I worked in restaurants for a bit and I did the same thing where it was like I could work three days a week, make two hundred bucks as a server. Yeah. So at, 600 bucks a week when you're living at home or your rent is cheap yeah. or whatever. I mean, your phone's what, like 15 bucks a month time, split with the roommates? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and we go down, so three days on, four days, you can go down to Baja. Yeah. You could surf wherever. It's the ideal life, but not sustainable. Yeah. So it takes, a, not, takes a toll on the body. It kind of prepared me for the hours, at least. Like, it was perfect because I was working a lot of nights. Yeah. So I was used to that. In the in moonlight at moonlight, yeah, I'd show up at like you know six o'clock or even nine o'clock in the summer, at night, and I'd work all night long till like three four in the morning. Wow, um, I'd come home and sleep, wake up at you know eleven noon, go surf, yeah, all day, yeah, you know, I um, I had all the time in the world, <laughs> yeah, and I'd do it all over again, you know, go. Did you develop a passion for it? Yeah. I mean, once I got into Moonlight, that's all I wanted to do. Okay. It's all I wanted to do is surf and then go straight to Moonlight and, you know, make surfboards and see what I wanted to try to get next. Even though I didn't get too many surfboards, you know, I ended up getting quite a bit. But, I, you know, with respect, try not to abuse my, my privilege of working at Moonlight and having access to all these amazing Channel Islands and stuff at the time and Bonzers, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, all those, there were so many boards back then too there. It's crazy. Yeah. So for somebody who actually wanted to get involved in the board building, that is the place you would go to want yeah. to get exposed to everything and to work hands-on with icons in the industry. Yeah. So it's um, fortunate that that's where your first entry point would have been. Oh yeah. I know. I, I got super lucky. It's crazy how that worked out. So what was the job that you were hired to do? And then ultimately, where did you find the best fit? I got hired to do satins, so wet sand gloss. Wet sand gloss. Yeah. Gotcha. Um, and then my friend, 
Bob Vinny, who I told you about, was a, the boat driver in mm-hmm. Tavarua. He also worked there. So I had two friends from Florida that I grew up with looking up to that were at Moonlight. He was a hot coder, routed fin boxes, did leech plugs, all that kind of stuff that, you know, in between the sander and the laminator position. He was, uh, I think he might have been going back to the boat to um, to um, Fiji or moving back to Florida. I can't remember what it was, but um, so from doing satins, he slid me into that. So I did that for a while. Okay. And that was <clears throat> that was where I learned how to work with the resin, um, and that was numbers because Stuber was doing you know an average of fifteen a day, okay, sometimes more, sometimes less, but pretty much he was on like clockwork fifteen, 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 um, which meant that I still had to do satins, but obviously I couldn't do as many as I was, okay. So I would do like prep like six, five or six satin boards, and then go hot coat come back, work on the satins a little bit more, then go back and grind my laps, put leash plugs in on boards I got hot coat on the bottom. I'd have to bust those out. Um, and soon after that, I started learning how to put fins on. Um, by this time, uh, the fin guy, Ernie Higgins, I think we talked about it the last podcast. He opened up his own shop. And I was already building my own boards start start to finish, you know, from... I'd get like a Channel Island and glass it, hot coat it, put the fins on, sand it. Um, and uh, I was getting decent at it for myself. Okay. Um, but I wanted to start laminating because doing satins after surfing all day and l- lugging that 5,000 RPM machine around and then hot coating and doing all, I was just getting... I was seeing Stuber like just breeze his way through, through a day, not knowing that <laughs> that's just as hard of work, if not harder. But to you, it looked yeah. Easier. He's, he just made it look like he was effortless with it, yeah. you know. So, just to clarify for people who may not know exactly what you're talking about, you're using a machine to sand the surfboard. Yeah. Gary's the laminator. Gary's the laminator. So Gary's holding the bucket of resin and a, a brush. And a little squeegee. And a squeegee, right, squeegee right. just pushing resin through glass. I'm so like, it looks that's what easy, I want to do. Right. <laughs> but he's still walking 10 miles a day around oh, yeah. the surfboard and still using exactly. his physical labor. Yeah, no and you're back and, yeah. So you wanted to laminate, but obviously he's laminating at moonlight, so there's not necessarily yeah, I, an opportunity I, I, he, for you there. He gave me a few chances, though. Like, I, I, started, he start, I started glassing a little bit. They were terrible. Okay. Peter was like, nope, no more of this. You <laughs> can't have this look, you know, same thing. Like they got, they have a, a, a quality standard to uphold there, you know, their boards are impeccable. Yeah. Um, so then uh, simultaneously, Ernie opened up her uh, glassing shop and he was like, hey, you want to be my laminator? You know? And uh, I was like, sure, you know? Um, and that's where I really started to learn how to, uh, they got this, there was this shop called Progressive Surfboards, and um, the owner suddenly passed away. I think he had an aneurysm or something. Mm. I, I forget, but um, they needed a. They all of a sudden it was like a glass shop with no head, you know. Like and this whole crew and and Ernie sort of absorbed them. Okay. And one of the things was like, I was like, wait, but am I still your laminator? <laughs> you know, like you got. There was some pretty legendary guys coming in, like George Larson. He was like a pretty famous like glasser from GNS, and you know, back, like really, really impeccable guy. And Dave Lott, who's also you know pretty solid, really, really good laminator and board builder. And uh, they they sort of tuned me up. Okay. You know, they were like, I thought I could glass at that point. You know. <laughs> They were like, all right, glass is poured. Let me see what you got. You know, I did it in the evening, and I came back the next day, and it just had tape and notes all over it. Really? This sucks. What is this? Um, and then, uh, you know, I had a few I had a few lessons with, with Dave, and overnight it just changed. Like, all of a sudden I was like, wow, I got this. He taught me a technique that was so simple. Okay. Um, you know, showed me how to cut the glass right, you know. I was cutting glass like the opposite way of how I should be because I'm kind of weird. Like I skate regular foot. I surf goofy foot. I do certain things with my left hand okay, and other things with the right, with my right hand. So I was cutting glass like a right-handed person. And he was like, try it the other way. 
And I was like, oh, <laughs> this makes sense now. Like, that's so weird. I mean, what we're talking about is fiberglass that's laying over a surfboard. And yeah, using when you a pair cut, of shears, cut the lap out. Why would, I don't understand what would the difference be if you're using one hand versus the other. Uh, How because do you get I, it wrong? Be, because uh, when I was cutting out the free lap going the other way, my lap was all wavy and weird. Oh, okay. I couldn't, I couldn't get a nice cut on it. Okay. And for some reason, when I switched it and went the other way, it was like, then I could control the, the width of the lap. Like the cadence of your walking? I guess, or creating... maybe my vision with the hand, you know? Interesting. Yeah, it was really weird. Like overnight, it was like, oh, okay. well, thanks for pointing that out. Okay. <laughs> Interesting. Because he was like, man, I, okay, have you tried go going the other way, using your other? I'm like, no. I mean, I'm still using my right hand, but I'm just going backwards. Interesting. So the only person I ever see do that is Jack Reeves. Okay. He's cuts the same direction I do. Yeah. Well, well I think Nainoa does too. So I'm glad to hear you mention that. Where would you even see Jack Reeves cutting? You know, like I'm In videos now. Uh, I didn't realize that till that's, later. That's kind of my <laughs> point is now we see things yeah. everywhere. But like if you're young and you're interested in laminating surfboards and you hear about these iconic guys, maybe you see the finished boards somewhere. Yeah. But was there somewhere that you could learn any of this? I mean, I was learned from watching Stuber. Right. Do those. And then, but he wasn't really that, that like, he was like, yeah, here's this and here's that. Go for it. And then he'd come in and, well, oh, it looks pretty good. Yeah. But, it, you know, I don't think it was. So you, but I, I was, I mean, I, I was, um, I was like competent enough to laminate a surfboard for myself, maybe for a friend. Um, I had a weird technique to do it, you know, from watching him. So I could glass a board already, but it's, but when Dave showed me his technique, is when it all made sense, okay. you know, and I was like, oh, I'm not so wild in what I'm doing. You know, there's like a, there's steps involved mm -hmm. and it doesn't have to take as long as what I was doing. I was so unpredictable with what I was doing. It was like, yeah. So he sort of like helped me out. Um, again, I don't want to jump way too far ahead here, but one of the questions kind of themes that I wanted to discuss with you today is, in the interview I did with Alex Banier, he said, like, bar none, I work with the best laminator in the world. Refer referring that. to you. Okay. <laughs> I knew you weren't going to accept the compliment, but I've heard a lot of people say that. When you ask somebody, surfboard shapers or even other laminators, like, who yeah. are the key guys, your name comes up as a being the best. So the theme that I want to discuss with you today is yeah. being the best in the world at something. Like... I don't talk to a lot of people in my life who are definitively the best in the world at something. Um, so how does, what are the elements that go into this to make you the best in the world at something? Like there is obviously a technique for laminating surfboards that you have to hit these certain things. You have yeah. to do these, but is there then an artistic element involved? Like we could talk about color work, I suppose, but is there a layup of different, uh, weaves of cloth that you can use that make yours better than others or like what are the key elements well I think it's my upbringing in the surfboard industry um, and again I don't think I'm the best um, there's a there's a pretty solid crew of laminators out in the world they you know they all can do a, an amazing job um, but you know like I think I just got to, uh, uh, I care about w what I do. So, and I'm also my own worst critic. Okay. Um, but I've also been like, you know, I, I went through the ranks of Moonlight. I saw what they were doing. They had like the utmost quality and respect from the world as far as what they do. And, and I, that's my foundation. Um, you know, and then I came across Mr. Tom Eberly. Mm. who was like a huge impact on me. Um, and just, you know, he kind of like took me under his wing, um, you know, and like a, uh, a father figure and advice and all that kind of stuff. And just in making surfboards, you know, just his whole outlook on everything. Um, you know, don't be a 90% guy, be a 110% guy, you know, uh, just give a fuck to what you're doing and just do the best job possible. And if you mess up, own up to it, you know, and fix it. Uh, don't pass it on to somebody else, you know. 
um, finish the job to where he always had this thing where it's like, do the board and pretend like it's going to get surfed right after you're done with it. So it's not like something that has to get pre-sanded or, and that goes with everything with hot coat, with finning. So, you know, um, that's how we would do it there. Okay. Uh, you could literally take a board in the sanding room before it got sanded with glass on fins and go write it. Really? Cause it was already that flat and perfect and, and nice, you okay. know, and just make everything good. So the guy after you has an easier time, which means it's going to come out better and, and it's going to be a better product at the end of the day. So, um, I just got lucky and got surrounded by really good board builders, starting with moonlight and Eberly. Eber Eberly's trained so many gnarly people have gone through his ranks. I mean, Greg Martz worked for him. Okay. Bob Hurley was one of his shapers. I mean, I can't even think of all the people that he's, uh, that have helped him or that he's helped. Um, and as you know, I mean, you talk to like Jerry Lopez, he's like, man, Tom Everly is one of the best classers I've ever had the pleasure of working with and alongside. Wow. Yeah. So he's very highly respected. He would be a great podcast guy if you can get him here. Is he still in Nicaragua? He's in Nicaragua. Would he do yeah. it via Zoom? I don't know. He might. Okay. He might. Yeah. All right. That might be pretty cool. Um, so you said you're lucky to have had access and experience, but there's probably a lot of other people who worked under him that didn't become the best in the world at something. Yeah, I don't know about the best in the world. I know you're thing. not going to accept it. Uh, <laughs> my point is that I'm curious what it is about you that decided to take it as seriously as yeah. you have and put in the number of hours that you have and the number of boards that you have and try to elevate well, what you're doing. I guess at the time, like, um, it just seems like surfboards – you know, cosmetically, we're just in a weird stagnant period. This was like late 90s. Yeah. It was like a lot of clear boards. Yeah. A lot of awful, like, simple airbrush, like, bottom color rail spray with a foam pin line on it, you know, sprayed on foam. Or, like, tribal, tribal <laughs> art. Just awful. Or, like, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, Posca pen art. It wasn't a lot of, like, really cool stuff anymore. It just seemed so, like, I don't know, just... And then the first few uh, tint boards I ever saw were at Moonlight were, and Abstracts. They were done by Gary, obviously. Gary was working sometimes at Donald's. So this is where this gets tied up together. Donald and Joel were already well into, like, doing resin color and trying to start it up again. I mean, they had to go find um, uh, Prindle out because the current guys at Donald's at the time weren't really, they were super rusty or didn't know how to do tints. So they had to go find Jeff Jeff Prindle and, you know, drag him back in and like, hey, this is what we want to do. Um, that's in a nutshell, you know. So uh, what what you're explaining is um, and then prior when I, to the when 90s. when I saw that, you know, when I saw Gary doing that, I was like, oh my God, that's the coolest thing I've ever seen. Like, that's amazing. So, and then I started to hear stories like, oh, that's how everything was. And I'm like, well, why aren't we doing that now? <laughs> like, why are we doing all this? Why is it everything so like clear and drabby? And like, like this is so weird. Um, and I also, I had, I had a thing for, um, you know, single fins. And I just thought how cool it was to have a shop. At the time, it was all glass-ons right before FCS. Yeah. Everything was glass on in the shop. And I'm like, wow, a, a shop with all color and single fin boxes. How amazing is that? Like, how many boards could you do? You know? Yeah, yeah. Um, so I had that in my head. I started doing my own boards and tents because Gary had some colors and, and I watched him do it, you know, and uh, the first few I did were just horrendous. Uh, I had a funny, there's a funny story about um, one of my favorite Magic 7-2 sunset boards that... Uh, Brian Fredrickson shaped me. It was my first attempt at an abstract, and it was like puke green and yellow and orange and some other color. It was awful. I did a inlay on it, and the inlay came out really messy because I think I had some color transfer on the bucket or something. So um, it was bad. The cut lap was terrible. And then uh, I got a call from 
uh, Jimmy, who was at the time working at Bain, they were developing the, the lockbox. It was the early incarnation. I think one board had been done. Okay. They're like, hey, you want to try out this lockbox system on this board? Like, we need a board. I'm like, uh, and they talked me. I'm like, okay, sure. But Peter was like, that can't leave the shop. It is so bad. So the thing was just laminated. He made me hot coat the deck, sand the deck, and he did a bunch of gloss color on it, and then we glossed it. Oh, <laughs> so the, the top of the board's finished, and then the bottom of the board's just laminated, like with the lap still, and, and it still needs to get hot coated. It's pretty funny. That's hilarious. So it got sent to Bain. They put the boxes in, and then they came back, and we finished it. But yeah, that, that was pretty funny. <laughs> um, so when you're explaining the timeline of his surfboard history, like, again, to kind of educate the listener in the seventies, let's say there was yeah. resin tinted surfboards. Yeah. So those boards are a specific color, but it wasn't, they weren't doing abstracts or anything. They're, at that they point, were doing right? some abstracts. I think it, I mean, I think it's all been done before it's at some, in some capacity. Okay. Every time I think something new was developed, I see a picture of something that was, I was like, I mean, if you think about it, that was the main way of coloring surfboards back then. Yeah. There was guys doing it in their backyards and their garages and surf shops all around the planet. Guys were getting... It would make sense that yeah. somebody would come up with an abstract yeah. at some point. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Then okay. they would they were doing dips and, you know, splatters and all kinds of stuff with resin, you know, and just playing with stuff, you know? So when you're saying there was no shop at the time that was doing it, and so that was an opportunity for you guys... What is the challenge? I mean, obviously, to me, it just seems like, okay, you got resin, you mix in some tint color with it. Is there more to learn than that? <laughs> yeah. Well, at the time, like, uh, the boards that Stuber was doing were uh, kind of like weekend project boards. They'd get in the way of 15 a day, you know? Gotcha. Um, and I think most shops were like that. Like, they were just so dialed into doing production, um, you know, I mean, I don't really know at this now I, I can't imagine, you know, because it's so like second nature to just tape a board off tint the color and do it. But I couldn't do 15 a day complete. There's no way, you know, with all the wait time and the cutting and all, there's a lot of steps involved. Yeah. Um, but it wasn't till it wasn't until Joel decided to start his own company and he wanted to do nothing but resin color. Okay. And not a lot. There's no. Sh I was already. Um, I'd already bounced from water lines, so I kind of skipped over. I think I talked about that in the last uh, podcast. But I was already at Tom Everly's place, and um, we hit a slow spot at water lines, and I did some boards at Tom's, and then we got busy again at water lines, and then we hit another slow spot. So I came back to Tom's, and Tom was like, hey. I give you work again are you gonna leave me hanging when your other shop gets busy and i was like no man I'm, I'm 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 in you know so he gave me the job and i was there and we were there i was there for a little bit um and then simultaneously joel showed up like hey i got a surfboard label and i want to do all resin color pin lines polishes can you guys do it because a lot of shops are too busy to handle this stuff you know um, and we were like, sure, bring it in. Like, what are we talking about? Uh, and he had a, he had a lot, he had a lot of work. I mean, his, it took off and this was about 2000. Okay. Was that label surfboards, surfboards by, Joel, by Tudor? Joel Tudor? Got it. Yeah. And he basically came up to the hill, which was the hills, Channon, Bain, Fins Unlimited. Um, Dinking was on the other side at the time, and West Coast glassing, and then all the shapers stalls at the end where Jim Phillips is, and Hank Bizak was there, Steve Clark, uh, Bill Shrosby, John Keys. Um, all of a sudden, that whole hill was pretty much almost Joel Tudor surfboards. Wow! Because Tony had his shaping machine there, so they were all getting cut there, and then all the all the eggs and shortboards like fish and stuff like that were getting done at west coast glassing us me um and then all the long boards were getting done at channon okay and we were cranking like there was so many boards they had i think they had two laminators they had jeff prindle and steve williams at okay. channon 
And then I was doing all the eggs and shorties at Tom's place. So that's and where then, you really started and, getting yeah, experience Yeah, and all of a sudden it color. was like my dream came true. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, wow, we're doing single fins and it's all color. Yeah. You know, I got pictures of of the, the sanding rack at, at you know, the, the racks, the, the whole, the sanding room was all in one room, but there's a whole wall of racks that was like boards in different stages. Some were hot coated top and bottom needing boxes. Some were already sanded. Some were ready to get sanded. Some were glossed, waiting to get polished, but there's like a hundred boards in this rack. Um, so that's where you really start to get experience at working with color. Yeah. Um, I'm curious, the conversation of like the different steps of the process and creative decisions that you can make along the way. So there are elements that you have to make sure that you hit that are just necessary for a good lamination, quote unquote. But how much creative expression is there involved in the process i mean there was uh there was quite a lot i think i mean the colors were all you know joel joel would spend a lot of time at the shop and we would come up with like he would find old pictures or he'd see an old movie and you know uh we would collaborate and do you know some some cool styles of abstracts or, or whatever um uh, but yeah, that's, I mean, I forgot what to, um, I kind of, my mind wandered off somewhere. No, <laughs> I'm curious about how much of it is art versus science, basically. And so at what elements in the process are you oh, I think most of it is science. There's a little bit of art there, but okay. it's, it's a science project to get it to look like that, for sure. Well, because again, back to the conversation of who are the best in the world at laminating, if it is just science and you're yeah. just hitting certain numbers and doing a certain technique, then it would just stand to reason that whoever's done the most is the yeah. best at it. Yeah. But there is a certain, I was pretty fortunate though, that there wasn't a lot of people to compare my stuff to. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It'd be different coming up now. There's so many good, good glassers and guys doing some pretty impressive stuff, but yeah. there was literally like, at least in my area down here in San Diego, there was like not a lot of people, especially in those early years. I mean, eventually people started to like turn around and start doing it. Yeah. But there really wasn't a lot of people to compare. Like I, I would have guys come in and, you know, Tom Everly knew everybody. So people would come in constantly like, you know, to say hi to him and they'd look around and be like, holy shit, this is, in this is insane. I'm stepping back into 1978 or whatever, you know, 1974. Yeah. This is crazy. You guys are you know, wow, I never thought I'd see this again, or holy shit, you know, I feel like I'm young again. Um, so it was, it was crazy those years, but yeah, I re didn't really have anyone to, uh, to compare it to. So I can do like the worst abstract <laughs> and it wasn't that big a deal. Cause it was amazing. Cause it, some that hadn't been done in, in a, in a little bit of a time, you yeah. know? Um, but then I started getting better at it. You yeah. know, uh, I had a, so at Channon, there was uh, a co-worker, well, not a co-worker, but uh, sort of a teammate, I guess. We're, we're both building Joel Tudor surfboards just in two different shops next to each other. Wyatt. Um, I don't know if you ever heard of Wyatt. I'm not sure. Yeah, he was doing longboards at, at Channon, and we, would, uh, have, we had a friendly competition um, between abstracts, you know? So sometimes he would do one that was like he'd come up with a, something that was like oh whoa how did he do that you know and then i'd like figure it out and then i would do something and he'd be like man how did you you know but we'd always kind of end up discussing what we did yeah but we i think like we pushed each other okay um to get better and better because we were super into it we we're like trying to get trying to get our abstracts to look like paisley print mm. you know um uh explain what an abstract is uh you know like basically like marbling like the inside of a marble i mean that abstract to me could be could be anything it doesn't have to be it's not like this one thing i call an abstract like everything i do are abstracts whether it's the color fades or a camo splatter thing or the resin fade could be you know it's a form of abstract um but i'm specifically talking about like the marbling or like the swirls which at the time if you said an abstract that's basically what everybody was referring to 
So but what's, what's, we were trying to come up with some new stuff, so we were doing all sorts of shit, trying to, you know, find out new techniques, trying to, I mean, we're just experimenting. We had the luxury of experimenting on high-end boards <laughs> at the time. I know. So how does that work? Does an order come through and they just say, hey, have at it? Like, yeah. we don't care what the end product right, looks right. like? Right, right. Okay. We're sending a lot of these boards. We're going to Japan. Okay. As it's always been, it's kind of, you know, they appreciate it. Um, seem to more than people around here or m maybe they can afford it. I'm not sure what it is. And what's the process for creating the abstract? So how do you, what do you do to get that marbling? Um, I mean, there's many ways, but you basically just drop a few little different Dixie cups of color into a base color or however, and then just put it on the board. What, whatever hits the foam first is going to stay on there. So that's basically the the formula. Um, is the is your creative work in the dropping into the bucket and mixing, or is it in the pouring of the resin onto the board? Or it's is all it? of it. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So there isn't a standard way that you have to pour the resin onto the board in order for it to get the best lamination. I mean, there's a way that I do it. That's my standard, but there's many ways to achieve it. You okay. know. Um, and you and you get a different outcome depending on what that is. They all can be cool, mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah, I mean, the way we do our abstracts was developed. Wyatt and I, and I know as well, we all we all, you know, we all do the same technique on how to get our abstracts together. But we were all in the same the same area, the same zone, together doing it. So yeah. We're sharing our knowledge. <laughs> yeah. Um, do you remember there? So one of the st aesthetics or styles that you've kind of become associated with is that uh, kind of blended. The stripes. Blended stripes. Yeah. Of color panels kind of. Joel uh, had a, a little, Joel had the uh, initial push to that. Okay. Because we were sick of doing, you know, swirls yeah. pretty fast for him. He gets pretty bored with stuff pretty quick, you know, and uh, and he would look through magazines and stuff like that. And he was like, like whenever he get personals, he would be like, he would tell me what he wanted, whether it was like a reverse lamination where you do the top first and um, or so I'd set the boards up and then he'd be like, I'm feeling these kind of colors, you know, mix up a bunch of. So this one time he called, he's like, mix like 50 Dixie cups of colors. You know, we're just going to like throw them on vertical. And he brought in with this picture. I think Prindle might, Prindle did some amazing stuff back in the day. Okay. Yeah. And somehow Joel would find these old pictures. I think he was working on Bing, Bing boards back then. Like he was doing some wild stuff. Um, so, and some of those boards, there's still pictures of the, the first, the first vertical stripe board I did. And the first ones were just random. We just mix a bunch of colors and just ran them down the stringer, not trying to do them neat, just sort of sloppy, abstracty, sort of in the vein of like Bradley Boobin, those those BB colors. I'm not familiar. Okay, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, that's a whole nother thing. Is he a painter? Uh, man, this is a whole nother podcast trying to explain Bradley Boobin. Give me the he, short he version. Came, well, if you he had a feature in the um, Surfers Journal just recently. Re yeah, like maybe two two journals ago. Okay. Yeah. All right, I need to bone up on yeah, it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, anyways, that was more in style of the, like that. Um, and then I've did you know once once I do something for Joel, the orders start coming in, you know, like right. do this, do this. So I started doing those, and then all of a sudden it just clicked. I'm like, I could do a rainbow, you know, like. And then I did the rainbow one, and then I, that's what kind of like clued me into starting to graduate the colors um and then i kind of stayed doing those those rainbow ones were pretty popular um and that lasted all the way up to like the you know the i think it was 2007 or 8 when we kind of hit a a big recession yep and then post clark foam shut down the blanks were just terrible um it seemed like the high-end surfboard sort of went on hiatus, mm. you know. Uh, and then it wasn't until I started working, met up with Jeff McCallum, 
and I had free reign on on a board. I think it might have been a kook box, um, and I did one. I forget what I did, though. I think I might have done a rainbow one, and Jeff was like, whoa, that's amazing. And then Jeff was like, could you do that with black, like fading it from white to black or something? And I'm like, yeah. So then we started doing that, and then that became... That be, like that got a second life, yeah. You know, because I hadn't done one in, in several years. Yeah. Um. But yeah, like Jeff. Jeff didn't care for the rainbow version of it, but he liked he the liked, black. He version. liked the app, the application, and how it looked. And then we just went nuts with starting to fade, you know, certain colors into other colors, and and uh, so that's how that came about. Um. Ultimately, wave storm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> ends up ends up essentially ripping off your design yeah it's kind of weird you know <laughs> it's, it's just the like, craziest i just got cut off ever. by a guy on a wave storm and you know like that kind of shit started happening you're like oh man <laughs> ultimate and he's writing your color work yeah. on the wave storm yeah how i mean what yeah, was the I moment have, that that epiphany that that happened that you recognized that? And is I think there a someone potential? tagged me on Instagram? Okay, you know, and I was like, "Wow!" <laughs> I mean, it's blatant. Yeah, it was pretty crazy. I think I think I even remember the board that they might have either based it off of too. Really? Yeah, I'm. Not, I I don't know. I mean, it's all, you know, it's so easily like denied, obviously, but it was pretty funny. Yeah, there's no legal recourse. No, there's really. no. Yeah, there's nothing. And you, you didn't do even have a copyright it. on it anyway. Yeah. Like, how can know. you? You know, like, yeah. it's not like you can recreate one. Right. They're all like pretty individual, so it's hard to like copyright something. Wavestorms recreated. Their, yeah, they their can, version. It's a picture. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was pretty funny. That just kind of shat on the whole thing. <laughs> Did it? Did it eliminate that uh, aesthetic from? Not really. I mean, um maybe doing that that rainbow one you know like that specific one sort of did yeah at the same time it but somehow out. birch did a rainbow and kind of brought it back to did he did so many rainbows on birch boards it's crazy but well, it's more in the style he did on the uh the psychic migration board. Yeah, yeah 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 well the um in a way it almost it does validate your work yeah more than it does um you know i don't know undermine it or eliminate the ability to continue to do it or anything like that it's just like you've officially arrived <laughs> you know <laughs> so um, it would have been nice to get some sort of royalty royalty off it or something but it's like we said it's so hard to yeah who knows i mean like i mean there could be a chance where i mean it's it's not like i invented you know blending one color into another right, right? But, no no, that's true, but you have become associated with a certain style. Right. And that's one of them, you know. Yeah. So Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um I guess we should probably give some love to LSD and since you're talking about different factories that you worked at, how did you end up here and what was the concept with developing this factory? Well, uh this is just a continuate. I mean, it's I feel like I'm still, you know, different shop but almost the same boards that i've been doing since west coast glassing like joel okay. tudor boards and everything that falls under that umbrella or that his influence as you know um he was working with jeff mccallum so that's the connection there you know with 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 kook box but so we were doing all the boards at um i mean it gets kind of kind of convoluted i guess that's the story of surfboard factories though <laughs> yeah it totally. is convoluted. and i might mess it up but basically in a nutshell we were doing everything we're doing here we're having done at gns jeff's shop had he was over running a glass shop he was just burned out um it was tough down there because that shop was really nice mm -hmm. you, you were there. there yeah but it was hard to get workers to go down there and drive everyone lived in encinitas and you're it's almost like you know if you're coming from oceanside it's like 100 miles almost like it was national city is where yeah, it was right yeah. which is like pretty close to the border and yeah. it's very commercial yes you're like in a commercial area like if that was here we'd probably still be running that shop yeah, because yeah. we but we had a hard time getting employees down there to guys that work you know we had a hard time finding a sander i remember went through like a bunch of sanders and 
some were awful, some were like good, but they couldn't drive down here all the time. So they had to get another job because they lived in Oceanside or so it was, it was a struggle. Um, he got burned out from running the show. I, he offered it to, for me to keep it going. I saw how hard it was and I was trying to help him find people to work there too. I was like, man, I don't think I want to, you know, um, take up, take this over. It's kind of a headache. You know, I'm not, I'm not ready to handle this headache. I just want to glass surfboards and do the best possible job that I can. Yeah. Um, so we, he closed it. We moved everything to GNS and at the time it was perfect. Um, they absorbed us perfectly. Um, and when it would s slow down on our end, I would help them doing GNSs, but they had a, they had an existing crew. Uh, but it, we, we fit, everything was going perfectly. And then COVID happened <laughs> and then things just went nuclear, you know, like not only did they get busy, but we got even busier. And then all of a sudden, like stuff just were too busy to get anything done. They weren't getting GNSs enough GNSs done. Um, our boards were clogging up the shop and it was just, we completely outgrew that, that space, all of us together, GNS, Birch, McCallum, Tudor, THC, um, all the other things that they do at, at um, Debbie's place. They don't just do GNSs, they do mitzvins. Like, can you imagine? It was just like, I mean, they were building, you know, rolling racks and rolling racks and they just fill up with blanks. Mm. Uh, and they're just getting crazier. So it was time. Uh, and then they found this place and um, that's, it was uh, out of need. We needed a new place. They just couldn't handle that place. Um, that's how we ended up here. So, so Joel, yeah, Joel and Kazu. Kazu. Um, he's been our. He's been the Japanese distributor for a, a lot of these guys for a long time. Um, so he just kind of like invested in a glass shop and kind of put everything un under one roof. Got it. Um, so. Yeah, that's how we ended up here. So, so, in a way, it's like familiar boards for me. Yeah. You know? Um, Lamination San Diego is the name of the business. Um, who's Who are the key employees? And then what? whose boards are you guys There's laminating? four of us. There's okay. me. There's Justin Pedix, um, who does all the hot coating, glass on fins, um, and then uh, and be beautiful leech loops, all, all that kind of stuff. And there's Alex Banier excellent sander and then we have tommy um who's a glosser and polisher and uh he's he's awesome he's he went from never working in a shop to this is his first gig and he's doing excellent really glosses and polishes which is the polishing is like one of the gnarliest jobs yeah. it's hard yeah he's pretty good at it yeah okay I good give him props good and so who's, we have a really tight crew uh wade was backing us up when mm. we were we were busy um, Larry Crow was coming in doing pin lines too. Um, but yeah, since it's slowed down, it's, it's gone down to just the four of us. And so we're, we're doing, uh, surfboards by Joel Tudor, THC, Jeff McCallum, Ryan Birch, Derek Disney. Um, and then, uh, Benny from Hermosa Surf Shop in Bird Rock. Yep. We're doing his, and he's building Rich Pavel surfboards through his shop. So we're doing we're doing those too. Got it. Yeah. Um. You said that things have, when things were busy, and things aren't as busy anymore. No, no, they've sort of they've leveled off. Also, uh, there's like something was going on in Japan where the yen, uh, the difference between the yen and the dollar was pretty big. Yeah. A lot of guys, like most of the stuff we do, majority was going straight to Japan. Yeah. And uh, it kind of, that got us through a lot of that. Like for the last 20 years, I've never really slowed down because mm. everything was always so, if the industry here would slow down, we'd still be busy because yeah. Japan was just hot. This is the first time in a long time that I've seen it this bad. And a lot of guys like Josh Hall was saying too, like his Japan orders and he was like mainly Japan too. And he, he took a big hit. Um, so that's kind of what really slowed us down. Not only leveling off with after the COVID buzz of surfboards wore, wore, wears off, uh, that really kind of 
got you know it it it, it hit us. So now we're just sort of I think it's starting to pick up a little bit. Yeah. Um, but we're just kind of transitioning into like maybe not so being focused on Japan until that starts up again. <laughs> I think that's a good thing. Yeah. Diversify. They've been a phenomenal um, customer yes. as a nation for a very long time, yeah. but it's risky to keep all the eggs in one basket. Totally. But the good news is for listeners is like for any of these board builders that you're mentioning who you couldn't get a surfboard from five years ago, yeah, you might now be able to get a surfboard from them. Yeah, totally. So start reaching out and yeah. that wait list is dropped. So yeah, now's the time. Actually. We have a little room too, you know, if, if anyone out there wants to get their boards glass, there's, it's a good time to bring it in now. Perfect. Hit, hit us up. Okay. Good. Joel, you know, good. Um, but yeah, I mean, for the longest time I hear people or just past year, they'd be like, yeah, I want, I want to get you guys to glass some boards, but I heard you guys are so busy or you're super exclusive. And we're like, not really. <laughs> we can do your boards. <laughs> All right, good. Let the, let we're it a little known. pricier than most places, but, you know, we can do, do, do a pretty decent job on your stuff. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm curious if you... Uh, I mean, given that you have access to all these incredible shapers, do you know or can you think of the best surfboard that you've ever ridden or your favorite board that you've ever had or maybe a couple of them? Oh, I've I've had a lot of them. <laughs> um, my favorite boards are, they're all in my garage. They end up just beat to hell and <laughs> it's just a shell of what they used to be, but that's kind of what happens to a magic board, right? Yeah. Um, Tom Everly made me a lot of magic boards a lot like some of my most favorite uh jeff mccallum made me a few Stu kenson made me one one in particular that i loved what uh, what kind of board the stew yeah it was uh the first single fin i ever rode so it really? must have been like 2000 when we started making surfboards by joel tudor yeah and uh it was like a six eight diamond tail and i was like that was my first introduction to actually riding like a proper single fin that was really cool it was a six eight. It felt like a seven six at the time. Okay. Now I couldn't even ride a six eight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> now I'd feel like too small. Right. Um, Eb made me some really, good, you know, because he has the whole. Not only did he shape lightning bolts, he had did all the hot stuffs on the mainland. So he had all those amazing Wayne Bartholomew templates. They had some really cool like early eighties single fins. Uh, there was a one board and model in particular the, the rabbit model but there was two there was like a there's three maybe i think there was a twin fin a thruster and a single fin the single fin one was one of my favorite designs it was like a stubby squash tail kind of thing single fin rode so good hmm. at the time i was living in la um so i was surfing a lot of zuma and ventura and it was perfect for the beach breaks up there okay. at least i'd like to think it was because he was those were made for like duran ball Interesting. So maybe because of that, they were like working good for me at beach breaks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. When I moved back down here, they didn't. That board in particular didn't work too well at the reefs. Yeah. I had to get something a little longer. Um, whose boards are you currently riding? I got a Alex Lopez, the one I was telling you about earlier, which is pretty cool. It's like a hybrid, like a uh, single fin outline, um, but it's a thruster. I'm back on thrusters. Okay. <laughs> Um, and then I got a, I got a, a thruster version of Derek Disney's Midzer design, which is like a wide point forward. I wouldn't say it's an egg. I mean, I, I guess it's a mid length, right? It's in that middle length. Like it's a seven, seven, five or seven, six, but it's kind of like a, like an egg that's sort of, or got like a, you know, 70 single fin somewhere in there you know stretched out in places it like it's got a wide point forward pulled in tail um the nose isn't round it comes to a point oh it does okay but it's it's a full board so yeah it's good for like when the waves are smaller or if i'm surfing you know somewhere like the cliffs or something like that the mids are refers to the little side yeah bite fins the little these they're twinsers but i have mine as a a, a thruster setup. Oh, you do? Okay. Yeah. I also got, I don't know what he calls it, but he makes a single fin ver version of it that I liked a lot too. He's, um, 
the side bite keels that he's putting on are glassed on glass ons yeah. but then he leaves the boxes available for the other fin yeah so you can swap but he's out. got a fin that goes with it oh he does yeah. okay yeah um he's gotten really popular yeah it's great a, surfer it's that helps for yeah. sure like but disgustingly good surfer <laughs> really good surfer but right the that style of board i guess you're right there are references to a lot of other boards that exist but it is pretty unique yeah in and of itself so yeah he's got a, he's got a cool thing going on yeah he does the alex lopez did you laminate that board yeah oh okay yeah yeah i didn't hear his name mentioned when you were talking about boards that come through the shop so i didn't know if maybe he got that done elsewhere yeah no no we we glass a few of them here okay um you know sometimes he'll 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 bring us a batch yeah um i think he uses i think he uses golden state or something those guys are cool too brian's uh i remember brian from when i worked at pure glass for about a year or two gotcha yeah. you've worked everywhere i spent some time around i didn't know yeah. you worked at pure glass yeah when it was uh in their original location i think that's funny yeah we're doing i was doing dano i got hired there to do danos okay so I was living in Santa. We were living in LA. I spent like a total of like maybe eight years living in Los Angeles, t two different times. Yeah. Um, but I was uh, driving. I was working at the Hill, um, and I do like sixteen or twenty boards in like two and a half days, just power. And then I'd go up, and I'd have like four days to to surf. This surf was actually, it was a good time to be up there. The the waves, the sandbars were good. It seems like everywhere. Okay. Um, and then, uh, but after a while, I wanted to, you know, I needed some extra income. Uh, so I f came across Clearwater. I forget how, not Pure Glass, Clearwater. Oh, Sorry. okay, gotcha, Sorry. gotcha. Um, so I don't, I forget how I linked up. I think a friend of mine let me know that they needed somebody. And then uh, it was Dano, because Dano was shaping out of there. Yeah. So he needed someone to do cut lap, full land stuff back then, and I'm, you know, yeah. So I did those. Sweet. Yeah. And then we moved back down here, and I had to stop working up there because I we got we got pretty busy again. Um. How's uh, the kind of ongoing conversation that we've been having over the last year or two is about the economics of board building, mm -hmm. and whether or not you can afford to live near the coast and also work near the coast in this environment. Yeah. Um. How's your quality of life? As being one of, I won't say the best laminator in the world, but <laughs> one of, and certainly one of the most famous laminators in the world, how's the light quality of life and lifestyle that you get to live? Do you um, get to take surf trips to Fiji all the time? No. <laughs> no, I don't take get to take surf trips. Um, I mean, it's pretty good, you know? I mean, yeah. it's a little bit of a struggle at times. California is just so expensive. Um, I mean, with, yeah, just especially lately with, the way inflation and stuff goes. Um, but I wouldn't say it's, it's, you know, it's, it's not bad. <laughs> okay, good. Are you able to surf all the time? Yeah. Although last week I just had terrible luck. And every time I went down there, I was picking the wrong windows, which happens at times, you know? Yeah. But yeah, I, I try to surf as much as I can. Um, but that means, you know, at this age, at this time frame, it, you know, a two hour session for me is a long session. Totally. If I go out and I get five fun waves all back to back, even if it's like about a half hour long, I'll just get out. Me too. Yeah. Yeah. I'm like, okay, I'm done. Sometimes I'll surf longer. Yeah. Rarely do I have like a nice long fun session and I'm able to have the energy to go and have a second one. Sometimes I'll do it though. Okay. Depends. Well, part of the reason why you would choose to work in an industry that you love is for the quality of life. Yeah. You know, like you're well, able to, to have the ease of not pressure of having to be somewhere not nine to five. Right. But at the same time, I kind of still do because I have a responsibility yeah. of four guys behind me and they're depending on me to work. Right. So at some point, the funny thing is like when you're single, you have all day to surf and you have all night to work. Yep. But then if you're like a normal person or something, you end up getting a partner and you get married and then all of a sudden, you know, you can't really surf all day and then go straight to work and work all night. Like right. you got to like, you know, start sharing some time with your lovely wife. <laughs> which is, And which then is, all of a sudden you're like, you know, your surf times, you start getting windows. But, you yeah. know, if you get good at your tide windows and all that, you could still 
get by, but sometimes it works against you. Yeah. So, yeah, I tell all the guys that are in their 20s, like, dude, take advantage now because it's not this easy. Not you at know? all. But the good news is you need less. Like you said, you need fewer waves yeah, and fewer times in the much. water. Yeah, you get a couple and you're good. Um, Th- those are my favorite sessions, actually, you know. You yeah. catch, like, a bunch of waves in a small amount of time and yeah. you ride them well and you're happy and you're like, all right, I'm content. It's all I need. Yeah. <laughs> I'm out of here. Are you able to take surf trips ever? Man, that's that's the one I haven't been able to really do. My my surf trips seem to be, for one, it's hard. It, it depends on the time of year, though. But like right now, it's kind of hard because that would mean who's going to laminate. You know, so, sometimes I'm a prison of the own your own like success, I guess, or yeah. your own. You know, uh, you know, I've like dug myself into this thing because like a lot of guys get to travel to go shape. And I would love to do that, but who's going to cover for me when I'm gone? Right. Like, it's hard to find people. I mean, I had Angelo come out, and he covered for me. I was about to go on, like, a a three-and-a-half-week trip to to Europe. That wasn't a surf trip, though. That was more of, like, music, DJ stuff, and not to go play, but just, you know, the scene over there is really cool as far as, yeah, anyways. Um but I ended up breaking my ankle like a week before our trip. And oh, uh, so that, that sucked. Um, what was my point? So you didn't, <laughs> well, getting somebody to fill your spot. Oh so you yeah. Yeah. Travel. yeah. So it's really hard to go on, on trips. Um, I would like to, I mean, uh, the last real trip I went to was a work trip. We went to, and that was, I'm embarrassed to say it was 2012. We went to Bali oh. to go work at, um, you know, Deos. Yeah. Got to surf a lot there, though. Yeah. Uh, that was really the last trip. Other than that, I've taken a few trips, but, um, you know, they've been more like cultural city trip. We went to Japan. For work? Yeah. Yeah. Well, for it, LSD. Was, it was an LSD party, but then after that, like, uh, you know, it was just me and Anna um, in Tokyo just having the raddest time ever. Sweet. Yeah. Good. So, yeah, yeah I, I mean, I've taken a lot of trips, but I haven't taken many surf trips. It just gets harder and harder. Yeah. I, I personally feel to manage my time as I get older, you know. And, yeah, victim of your own success. Like, for me, with the podcast, as it grows, it's just it's hard to delegate out roles. You yeah. Know? Like, I feel the same thing you feel about. I need the weekly production to maintain but i don't feel confident enough to hand any of it off to anybody else yeah to think that they'll maintain the oh, same i could hand it off i just <laughs> there's not a lot of people that because they're busy at their shop yeah so it, it's like right now it's it's you know it's yeah. everyone stretched out pretty thin um so do you, although do you have any back anybody coming through the shop who would want to learn the craft i had a i had a kid um uh but it just it it got to it got slow enough to where it didn't right. make sense, and at the same time I have to I have to make a living too. Yeah. So, um, hopefully, it, when it picks up again, I don't mind teaching people. Yeah. You know, um, you have to kind of prove to me that you're in it for the right reasons. You know, right. I mean, there's people that you you start to show them, and then it turns out they only want to learn something so that they can, you know not help you out but like glass their own boards or something or something like that and it's like oh man i just spent all this time and effort on someone it's not gonna to create my competition basically (laughs) and they're out of here (laughs) Um, and i mean it's not not, it's kind of that but you know i'm I'm, i guess i'm kind of a gatekeeper in a way but not really you know like i share knowledge and stuff with people yeah but they share stuff back with me too, right. you know. Um, I'm not one to like post videos of myself doing my techniques on Instagram. I've noticed that. Yeah, yeah. I don't do that stuff at all. I mean, it's, I don't think U.S. Blanks will put out their formula for foam for right. the world to see. No, yeah, <laughs> you know, exactly. or if you ask like a chef what his secret sauce was to something that you ate, he's not going to tell you. Definitely you got to protect not. your knowledge somehow. Yeah, but I will share it with people, and if you know, I've. You know, I've shown I've shown plenty of guys. I've let them watch me and stuff. So it just depends on the okay. situation. Well, 
for anybody out there listening who wants to actually learn the craft, sounds like you're open. Yeah. Open to teaching. There's just not a lot of work right now. Yeah. You know, that's the thing. Yeah. There was, a, there was when, I, when I had someone here, we had enough boards that, and he, he was getting pretty good. Um, but, yeah, I think he ended up deciding to go back to school and stuff. I think it's kind of scared. He was pretty young, though, too. Yeah. He was, like, 20. Um, it's it. You have to do it for the passion. I mean, we've talked about that plenty, yeah. but it's, like, it's not lucrative enough to entice anybody into it for any other reason. Yeah. There's other things you yeah, can do. Yeah, it takes and, a certain character. Yeah, it does. <laughs> um, speaking of going back to the DJ thing. Yeah. Um, what are your ambitions with that? Well, at one time, you know, I'd say, you know, over 10 years ago or maybe longer, like I did kind of want to consider it being like my job. Um, I was super into it. Uh, in fact, we were living in Los Angeles and, and, um, I was playing a lot up there, you know? Um, but I've always approached it as like a fun thing and I never really had a professional mind for it. Like I hate, I hated the whole aspect of being a DJ, <laughs> but I love to play records and I love collecting music and buying music and, and I love all that. I just hated the whole like promoting yourself and the, the press shots and all that, all that stupid shit. Um, so I guess that's kind of like, it just didn't interest me at the end of the day, you know? Um, but what did interest me was just, you know, playing records at parties. Um, most of these parties were underground, like in the Los Angeles warehouse district um, you know, small, small, it, this, you know, I wasn't like Coachella or there any of those big parties at all. You know, it was yeah. like super underground two, three, four, five hundred 500 people, max parties, areas you wouldn't want to go walk around in unless you're inside the party. Right. <laughs> um, yeah, it was like completely foreign to any surf related. It was kind of cool. It was sort of like a release thing. You know, I don't have to think about anything surf related or work related or surfboard or anything like that. In fact, like when someone would try to talk to me about it, I'd be like, Ugh. yeah, like, don't talk to me about that right now, please. <laughs> I, when you're fully absorbed in surfing, you do need yeah. a totally cleansing thing just to refresh. And, and when I started to get serious about it, that's kind of what it, it yeah. did. Cause I was like, what do I, 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 and I remember specifically, it was like, uh, there was a really good year, 98, I believe, where it was like the, whole, the entire year, the surf was epic. It was, we had a good summer, we had a good, uh, epic fall, an amazing winter, a pretty good spring, and then it just went flat. I can't remember what year it was. It's kind of foggy, but it was like 98, 99, maybe, and it was just terrible, and and I was recently broken up with my, my uh, ex-girlfriend at the time. I was living on my own. And for the first year, I was like, for the first, like, six months, it was epic because I was surfing. Didn't even have time to think about anything, you know. Then it just went flat. And I was like, what am I doing? Like, what is my life? Like, what am I doing here? Like, yeah. There's not, I'm not, I'm so boring, you know. And I got all this music and stuff. So I started going out. And I was, I was like... I'm just like in my twenties, like just wasting away here. Like, let me go have a social life again. And then I, uh, found out, um, some of my favorite DJs would be playing, you know, so I started fo following them going out, meeting a whole new group of people that had zero to do with, sur with surfing. And it was like a whole nother world to yeah. get absorbed into. Yeah. And then that led me to meeting, uh, my my wife getting into learning how to play um her teaching me how to play yeah she doesn't dj anymore though but what does she do now for work uh she's a hairstylist oh, by okay. trade okay but she hates doing it okay <laughs> <laughs> she do anything long enough so yeah um uh, uh, right now she's into like selling vintage clothes okay and we're actually starting to get stuff going um, you may or may not see me plug her online store at some point here. Gotcha. So we'll see. Right. We're actually doing one of the 
there's a lot of like vintage swap meets that happen. Mm -hmm. So we're probably going to be doing a few of those. Cool. Yeah. I, I usually help her out. Um, do you get invited to pay for play? Uh, I play just, for pay. <laughs> I just DJed. Uh, I just DJed Saturday night at um, Kettner Exchange. So oh yeah, I, I still do those. But that's. I saw that. Yeah. Those are like un, kind of unpromoted. This it's just you're part of the staff. Yeah, like it, you, I feel like I'm part of the staff there. It's not like something that you're going to. It turns into a little event at mm -hmm. the end of the night, you know. But you take people from like having dinner, um, and then. The restaurant closes and the bar stays open and usually there's like a little tiny dance floor. Yeah. Um, I'm not playing like techno or anything there, but, you know, right. kind of playing some dancey head naughty music there. Cool. Yeah. Um, I've done that a few times. So um, I sort of like, it seems like once COVID hit, I sort of stopped playing out at parties and I'm, I'm 51, <laughs> you know, like... I got no business like that. That's a that's a hard life as well. You totally. know, you're basically living a rock and roll lifestyle. Yeah. You know, instead of guitars and long hair, it's bass bins and late late nights into the wee hours. You know, totally. In fact, a, a lot of my gigs were like closing out a rave, oh, okay. and I wouldn't go start playing till like five six in the morning. But I would sleep early, and then wake up at three in the morning go through a 24-hour Starbucks drive through and then drive up to L.A., play a party, you know? Um, when you when you start at 3 or 4 or 5 in the morning, yeah. how late do you play? Oh, the, a few hours. So, I mean, some you some can go till, like, late morning. Wow. <laughs> I'm so not cut out for that lifestyle. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, I did it for a long time. Yeah. Yeah. Wild. Um, final question is... Same time, same question I asked you last time we chatted, which is, what kind of surfboard would you order now if you were to order something from someone? From any time period? Sure, yeah. I would love to get another, like, Doug Wright rainbow surfboard because he retired from shaping. And uh, I always thought that East, like, Florida shortboard shapers, like, those boards worked insane. Interesting. Yeah, like, Ricky Carroll and Rich Price and Jeff Klugel, Greg Lower, um, uh, Doug Wright, all made amazing short boards. I mean, they're all great shapers, but yeah, uh, I just I loved how all those boards look. Every time I I see one now, just hold it. I don't know if I could ride a short board anymore like that, but I would love to get a Doug Wright. He made him some magic boards. I love that style of board. Yeah. That 80s thruster mm -hmm. wide. Or the 80s quads. Those I never quads had any, really but good. yeah. I mean, I didn't like quads back then. They always felt really loose because of the way the fin placements were. Yeah. But he, I got a secondhand quad from Doug Wright that was more in line of almost like what you see now. It was like ahead of its time. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and that thing was magic. Yeah. I love, yeah. I that, remember uh, I bought it off an older friend who was probably in his, he was an adult. I was 15 or something, 16. He was, he was about to go do a jail stint for, uh, for cocaine, for cocaine. <laughs> so it was a brand new rainbow. Um, yeah, that thing was, that was a magic board. That was my first magic board. Was it? Yeah. I felt like I learned a lot on that board. Yeah. And then I got a few magic boards from, from Joey, from, uh, uh, you know, uh, backyard surfboards. Mm -hmm. Um, but, uh, yeah, I'd probably get a Doug Wright. That's a great call. Yeah. Um, would... do you document every board that you laminate now? No. Do you wish that you would have at some point? Um, maybe that would just take a lot of space in my phone. Yeah. I like did pictures. Yeah, take organizational, you know. I mean, we did so many boards on the hill, too. It would it'd be cool to get some pictures of those because those I've got in my memory bank, and that's not that's not working too well. Exactly. That Well, that's <laughs> what I was thinking about it is as you were telling your and story. And a lot of those end up in Japan, too. That, most of those ended up over there. It would just be so in, worth, from a history standpoint, it'd be so worth yeah. having a catalog of. Do you have any idea how many boards you've laminated? No, I mean, 
you can maybe do the math like uh I have no idea. I guess give or take 20 a week. I mean at some point I was doing a lot more. Yeah. All color, you know, I mean all like resin color, but just go by average 20 a week since about 2000 with maybe about a year and a half break. Um but I don't know. I guess do the math on that. Yeah, I'd have to do it after the fact. And can't I can't do it in my I head. really only take about like you know, Christmas, the week of Christmas off. Mm -hmm. Maybe the occasional surf trip, especially back then. Yeah. But um for the most part it'd be times 50 weeks a year maybe, you know. Okay. Right? It's 52 weeks in a year, right? Yeah. So if you give or take that somewhere between say 48, 49 20 a week. I don't have terrible at math, but times easy. 20 years. Yeah. 24 years. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm going by like when I started doing the tutor boards is when I started, my numbers were pretty solid. So and that was about 99, 2000 like that. Yeah. Some, somewhere in that era. Yeah. And it hasn't slowed down really since. Right. You know? Right now. It's the first time how you see the shop. Yeah. Um, well, I'll try to enjoy some time off. Yeah. Oh, I enjoy my time off. Okay, good. Try to, well, I mean, rather <laughs> That's than... That's where the whole DJ thing came in from. <laughs> I just mean rather than stressing about the business not being there, you know, yeah, try to yeah, just yeah. actually enjoy it because it'll be back. Of course, and you'll yeah. Be working the too surf hard. industry is very resilient. It is, right? Yeah, it yeah. always bounces back in, in some form. Like, yeah. it always evolves into something, you know? Good. I've been hearing it's going to end forever. It never <laughs> does. Seriously. Bill Bain used to come in and tell me, it's going to all go to shit. They're going to change the resin, Alex. And it's like, here we are. You know? you know what, though? People feel that way because it operates on a shoestring budget. Yeah. So you feel like if those racks aren't full, I can't pay my bills next week, essentially, is what yeah. it feels like. But the reality is um, there's a core number of surfers who always need surfboards. And yeah. so if you build your business on that number... You'll always have work. You'll make it from week to week. Yeah. It was when you experience the boom of COVID and maybe feel like you're unstoppable for a period of time. If you base your oh, business I knew off it was coming. <laughs> yeah. So if you base your business off those numbers, yeah. it'll go down and you'll get crushed. Yeah. But if you base it on that core number, I think I you'll mean be this okay. place needed to happen, um, aside from COVID, just because we were so jam packed even before COVID at at GNS. Right, you know? right, right, right. It's a one wet room shop. Yeah. So everyone's like, it's a very tight schedule. Yeah. Um, they're doing great now, by the way, like with us not being there, like they flourished. Sure. We were just kind of in their way. Um, they, they needed to focus on GNS and you can see what they're doing now. They've kind of like really brought that back. Totally. Yeah. yeah their stuff's incredible. Yeah. So. All right. Very good. Well, thank you, Alex. Yeah. Great to, reconnect with you yeah yeah likewise thank you <laughs> thanks welcome. welcome to the pod van surf splendor